it matches yeah. everything. I, I've never, I've never used it. I don't want to start Sorry. now. I Should I do it? Should I do it? What's your power? Good afternoon. Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee members. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it is the April installment of our uh, illustrious work. Um, it is 1233. Thank you all for coming. We do have a quorum. Um, let's just go ahead and get started with introductions. Is anybody dying to go first? Carrie. Carrie Sheldon, Precinct G. Jeff Danes, Precinct D. Diane Graham Raff, Trellis, the Area Agency on Aging. Patty Thorson, Trellis. Daryl Paulson, uh, Precinct F, or the Vice Chair. David Fenley, uh, Chair. Andy Striesick, Metro Mobility. Patsy Murphy, C. Richard Rowan, AARP. Heidi Meyer, um, Minnesota CCD. Michelle Severson, Minnesota Council on Disability. Doug Cook, Metro Transit. Thank you all very much. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve this month's agenda. So moved. So <laughs> One of you is going to second it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, is there any discussion? Amazing. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions. And I would, I would also entertain a motion to approve uh, March uh, meeting minutes. There's no way I'll lie. We have to deal with I, nope. I don't see anybody. No. Yeah. I would entertain a motion to approve. approve. Okay. Thank you, like Patsy. <laughs> Patsy. I'll second. Patsy motions. We have three seconds. Let's go with Daryl. <laughs> um, uh, thank you both very much. Is there any discussion? All right. Uh, uh, approve. Yay, please. Yay. If you approve, please say yay. <laughs> yay. 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 <laughs> I am clearly not firing on our on our on all cylinders today. I apologize, friends. Um, uh, uh, disapprove nay. Abstentions. Fantastic. That that passes unanimously as well. Let's just dive right into business. We got um, a, a lot of actually, I think, really good stuff. Stuff that the committee's been asking for um, that we're discussing today. So let's let's just get it kicked off uh, with LRT uh, transit service update from uh, the general manager, Brian Funk. Nice to see you. It's been a few months, maybe a year. Uh, Good afternoon, and uh, actually, uh, I'm Deputy General Manager and the Chief Operating Officer, um, and so, uh, but again, for uh, committee members who I've not had the pleasure of addressing, my name is Brian Funk. Um, I do serve as a Deputy General Manager and the Chief Operating Officer, and so I've uh, been with Metro Transit for uh, almost 22 years now and had the pleasure of coming before this group uh, on a number of times on a number of topics, and uh, today, uh, as a uh, Chair Finley in introduced, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some updates on the light rail uh, and uh, specifically some uh, introductions to service plans uh, as well as the number of train cars we're operating per train, which is what we call a consist size. So uh, I'll walk us through uh, the presentation and just wanted to start out by saying that, you know, this is something that uh, really looking to get some feedback either today or in the future about uh, how this is working. Um, this uh, notion of operating uh, different size train cars is not entirely new to our service. Uh, as folks might be familiar, we started uh, the Blue Line, uh, then called the Hiawatha Line in 2004. And uh, over the years, we've operated from one car to two car to three car trains. Uh, three cars at, at a time is the maximum we can do based on the length of the platforms as well as the city blocks in both of the downtowns. And so uh, there are some limitations, but um, in today's presentation, I hope to introduce you to a little bit about our service profile, those future plans, um, and then maybe we can uh, get some feedback. So uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, as I uh, intimated, Metro Transit right now is preparing to uh, want to add light rail service um, out there uh, on the system. And the way we're looking at doing that next would be uh, improving the frequency uh, in August of this year with our quarterly service change. 
Uh, right now, since the summer of 2022, we've been operating 15-minute service, and I'll show on a, a future slide a little bit more about the details for that. Um, you know, but uh, we're starting to uh, be able to have some good fortunes in hiring train operators. Uh, we understand from our customers that their experience is improved when we have more frequent trains. Uh, missing one train right now, uh, as I experience uh, on an occasional basis if I'm running behind, uh, can be quite a long delay. And so uh, we continually want to strive to uh, add to the number of trains operating every hour. Uh, as it stands uh, right now, again, since 2022 in the summer, Jason will get our slide back up here in a second, um, we have been operating uh, with three car trains uh, all day, every day. Uh, regardless of the customer demand. And so uh, we have a situation where we've been accumulating um, mileage that may not need to be accumulated because we don't need the additional space, but uh, it was an intentional decision for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that we wanted to make sure as we uh, were both in the time when the pandemic was uh, the most challenging and as we were emerging from that, uh, in 2022 and early 2023, that we provided enough space so that if people uh, did not need to be shoulder to shoulder, uh, that there was room to be able to spread out. And I think that um, as a, thankfully as a society, we've moved to a, a little bit better place with that, even though uh, there are some infections that are still going around. But uh, really as noted in the third bullet here, what happens when we uh, operate uh, those three car trains without consideration for the demand, is that we're accumulating uh, unnecessary mileage on each of those cars. And so, uh, we, including the cars that have been delivered for the Southwest Light Rail Project, we have 118 vehicles. Uh, and at any given time, we need to make sure that uh, trains are being inspected and repaired. And uh, we have midlife overhauls going on at various stages because again, those the first cars that we received uh, were delivered back uh, in about 2002 for the 2004 service. And so we have trained cars that are well over a million miles uh, and we need to be able to take care of those for about 30 years before we'd be looking at uh, a significant or a complete replacement. So the capital investment is, is heavy and we wanna be mindful of that from sort of that business perspective. Uh, it also places the inspection and repair demands on our light rail maintenance staff. Um, and they're currently understaffed. That uh, I don't think is a surprise to anyone who follows uh, organizations that need uh, people with diverse and complex skill sets. But um, you know, we're uh, hiring and recruiting and looking at standing up additional workforce development efforts. But um, like many organizations, we're challenged with finding enough people with the right technical skills to be able to complete all of the work we have. And so uh, we wanna be mindful of that, especially as we look to add service. We don't wanna to continue to add to a maintenance backlog uh, or maintenance deferral that uh, is not a good um, move from our asset management and state of good repair perspective. Uh, I'll note that you know one of the tools that uh, we have to be able to hire more staff is looking at our starting wages. Uh, you may have heard, but at the end of February, the Metropolitan Council uh, approved a contract that the ATU Local 1005 membership ratified, and uh, that bumped the starting wage up to almost $38 an hour uh, on the base rate. Uh, we also included shift differentials, and there'll be another uh, increase coming this August. And so we know that we're more competitive, and uh, we're just gonna continue to work really hard to get those positions filled. Uh, and then finally, on this slide, right-sizing the, the size of the uh, light rail vehicles, you know, it yields those important savings. And so in addition to the day-to-day -day maintenance uh, that we're evaluating right now as we look to be able to add service, um, you know, we still have annual savings that uh, total across our fleet of about a million miles uh, each year in saved uh, maintenance. And each one of those miles is an opportunity for something to happen. And so we're mindful of that as well. Uh, and then in the future, it means that our overhaul programs come due a lot faster. Uh, and frankly, the more often you're doing them over this, the 30 year lifespan of a vehicle, it could add a complete overhaul to each one of those vehicles, you know, which you're looking at the tune of a half million dollars or more in today's dollars. So uh, there are you know, real significant savings that uh, can be realized from this, but as I'll describe, uh, we're not looking at this as a standard, do it all day, every day, regardless of the circumstances approach. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, for those members uh, and folks who are uh, 
on the uh, call from the hybrid setting, just to orient you towards our current light rail service snapshot. Um, as I mentioned, we're currently running 15-minute service um, is what we call it for most of the day. And so that runs, as shown here in the lower right corner of the slide, from about 5 a.m. until 9 p.m. Uh, the green line, first train uh, rolls out and starts service uh, a couple blocks away at Union Depot at 429 in the morning. Uh, and trains keep coming right after that. And so uh, very quickly, we're up to that 15 minute service frequency from very early in the morning uh, until you know early evening. And then the same thing uh, repeats itself um, on the blue line, uh, starting service um, aside from the uh, Terminal 1 to Terminal 2 airport shuttle, which runs 24 seven. Um, blue line starts just after 4 a.m. Uh, in both directions and so, uh, it's a long service day. Uh, we still have to take care of the uh, rail, <coughs> railroad, the tracks, the signals, the overhead power. And so we have a lot of crews who are working overnight as well uh, when it's safer for them to be out there and uh, not in between trains. Uh, and then, you know, the train service uh, operates with last trip starting after 11 p.m. And, and wrapping up after midnight. Um, that service span is something that is not as long as some people are looking for, but we're evaluating the trade-offs uh, with that as well um, for both the expected customer demand and, and how that plays in. Uh, in the last couple of uh, free ride promotions that we've offered in partnership with Miller and Coors, uh, we have added some trains after midnight from the downtowns for New Year's Eve and St. Patrick's Day when we uh, expected that there might be some demand and it would help with uh, reducing impaired drivers on the road. Next slide, please. Uh, and here's a snapshot of our ridership. And so uh, we'll take Green Line, which is on the left side of the slide first. Uh, in February, uh, within that 28-day, 29-day this year uh, period, uh, we were at almost 800,000 rides for the year. And so uh, it's been very strong. We're at uh, close to 30,000 rides a day. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, we were at about a little over 44,000 rides a day. So we're still down uh, a considerable number overall, primarily based by uh, those work type commutes. And so we've seen a stronger rebound for all day type rides. Uh, that's been uh, described by my colleagues and, and the general manager in the media. Um, and so we're looking to really adapt and make sure that we're maximizing uh, our utility for the communities. So uh, we are up 28% from last year. That's a, a great early indicator of how this year is going. I think that the mild winter may have had a little bit of something to do with that, but uh, hopefully our good fortunes continue. And on the green line, uh, weekends are significantly lower than weekday for ridership. Uh, the University of Minnesota, both between the student rides and staff rides with a universal uh, U-Pass, drive a lot of ridership on the weekdays on green line. Uh, the stations on campus, Stadium Village, East Bank and West Bank, uh, are very high in there where we see our, our peak loading on each of the train cars. Uh, and then on the right of the slide, blue line uh, is less ridership than green line. Uh, again, uh, that's uh, been the case for a number of years since Green Line launched, but uh, it's even more pronounced now with the lack of uh, commuter traffic on weekdays consistently uh, between the park and rides uh, down by the airport area into downtown Minneapolis. And so we've seen a shift to more of uh, all day travel patterns, uh, more actually ridership in the afternoon than the morning. Uh, and it's been pretty steady so far this year. And so we'll see uh, as the twins start their season tomorrow, we're hoping for a nice bump with our event ridership and there's some concerts this weekend and uh, we certainly have the capacity to be able to deliver a good experience. And interestingly on Blue Line, uh, weekends and weekday are pretty close uh, in overall ridership, which I think really just speaks to uh, that different use case right now. Next slide, please. And so uh, as we uh, started to look at uh, what were we going to do to be able to improve the service, one of the things that we knew because of those maintenance um, uh, deficiencies in staffing is we needed to look and see uh, what would be the difference between operating more frequent service with two car trains versus our current service with three car trains. And so uh, being able to come more frequently, even with less capacity, was something that we wanted to evaluate uh, from a data perspective. And so a cross-functional team between 
uh, our rail operations department, our strategic initiatives group, uh, as well as our service development teams uh, looked at this and, uh, and dove in to uh, evaluating both, both sides of that equation. And so on the left side, you can see the results um, of what we did when we reviewed our maximum onboard counts with our current 15 minute frequency. Uh, we saw that weekday ridership, if we moved to a two car train, would result in overcrowding on several trips. It was about three trips per day, uh, mostly in the morning. It was 8.42, 9.42, and 10.42, so it had to do with class arrivals and departures. Um, and uh, there would be, however, no or minimal impacts on Blue Line based on, on that study. Um, and then we saw that based on the weekend non-event ridership, so a standard like we had last weekend, a standard weekend uh, would not result in overcrowding um, on either line if we use two cars, even at a 15 minute service. So then uh, we applied that looking forward to say, if we're gonna improve the frequency, uh, then how would that translate to? We have more trains per hour um, to be able to spread out that demand a little bit. And so we did some forecasting. And uh, what we saw is that we would expect that uh, the green line using two car trains on a 12 minute service would move back to a feeling more like 2019 levels. So we would have those intermittent times like around campus where we would see uh, that people uh, who are able to may be standing uh, for short periods of time. Uh, there may be a little bit less room for some uh, bicycles, things like that. Um, but by and large, uh, it would not result in a condition uh, that we deemed unacceptable or that we had heard, again, based on that uh, 2019 or earlier levels uh, that customers would react negatively to. And so that was uh, a good indicator. And then again, it validated that um, on the weekends, uh, without those events, uh, we would not expect to see uh, any overcrowding or uh, significant impacts on the weekends. And next slide. And so uh, understanding that, um, as I uh, alluded to in my introduction, um, here's our strategy or our, our planned approach is to uh, deploy two car trains strategically uh, to gain that additional experience uh, and customer and employee feedback. Uh, this is something that we know will be different. Uh, as I said, this is uh, not unique. We have done this and deployed this strategy a variety of different ways uh, over my time with the organization. Uh, we also know that it's uh, fairly commonplace for uh, other rail operating transit agencies to customize the number of train cars per trip uh, based on that expected demand. And so what we are looking at um, is uh, starting April 13th, which uh, is a, a weekend when we have a light event schedule, uh, is that we would start to utilize two car trains only on Saturday and Sunday service days um, for the remainder of this current service change. So 15 minute service, two car trains, Saturday and Sunday when we do not have uh, events like, uh, as noted here, we would plan for three car service when the Minnesota Twins are in town because we know that uh, whether you're an event goer or just somebody who's looking to get on a train after that event lets out, we wanna provide the capacity that uh, our customers need. And the Minnesota United at Snelling and University is another example where uh, that can help. Uh, as I mentioned, our data supports that this would result in a minimal uh, customer impact, but we recognize data can't tell us everything. And so we want to uh, encourage feedback, uh, measure the impacts, and then document before we take our next steps. And so this is the first time that we would have an opportunity to uh, do planned outreach and connect with customers and inform people other than on an ad hoc basis that this is uh, what we are intending to do. Since we did a pilot uh, that was related more to safety and security uh, testing in the summer of 2022. So uh, this is unrelated to uh, that aspect, uh, but we wanna measure and see if there are any uh, unintended consequences or maybe some uh, really good outcomes that we hadn't uh, anticipated. And so on the communication front, uh, you know, leaving today's meeting, we can maybe tailor and make some updates, but we're really looking at uh, making sure that there's advanced communications uh, through our, our traditional channels as well as to directly to our customers out on the platforms, on board the vehicles um, when we have those impacted dates so that people understand that they may see a three-car train on a Friday and then the next day 
Uh, is it a two car or a three car? We don't want to leave that up to uh, complete guessing. We want to be proactively communicating so people know primarily uh, where to stand or wait um, on the platform. And then uh, that on-platform signage denoting when those two car trains are operating because that would be our atypical service. Um, and again, as I mentioned at the outset, additional suggestions for how we can best communicate from this group would be appreciated. Uh, and then my final slide is next. Uh, and uh, assuming that we uh, gain some experience and um, you know learn a little bit here, our plan would be that uh, June 15th is our next quarterly service change and, and update. Uh, the University of Minnesota will be out of session at that point in time, so the, the data that showed we'd have some challenges on campus uh, would no longer be applicable, and so we'd be looking at uh, using two car trains on a more regular basis on those non-event days uh, to be able to gain more experience in a weekday setting um, with a goal, as noted here in August, uh, to improve our frequency to 12 minutes, uh, continue to utilize two car trains on those non-event dates where targeted for the expected demand. Uh, we recognize that there are a lot of events in the Twin Cities. It's a vibrant community. We're gonna need to be really smart about this and accept feedback to make sure that we're providing a good experience. So um, those, uh, that August service change is you know, really dependent on ensuring that we continue to have success with train operator recruitment and hiring. Uh, we're doing well right now. We have more than 20 uh, new operators who have started with us since last year that uh, came to us directly from outside the organization, and that blends with uh, internal transfers from bus operator positions. So uh, we're forming a really good team and, and uh, getting things going here as, um, as time goes on. So um, we're expecting to make a decision about that service frequency in May so that we can communicate that well ahead of time. Uh, and then the final goal is really to uh, restore a 10 minute service frequency for a good portion of the day. Um, as somebody who rides the service a lot, both buses and trains, I know that um, anything longer than a 10 minute wait, again, if I just miss that uh, bus or train can feel like a long time or it can cause me to be late or miss appointments. And so um, that's uh, one of the goals and it's not just because uh, I, Brian, want that service. Uh, we've heard from customers over time that uh, that's really important to them. So, uh, so with that, I'll say thank you for having me today and would uh, welcome any feedback. Thank you, Brian. Go ahead, Heidi. Um, are you looking at, because um, I've been on the trains many times and just standing on the platform, I've seen some very dangerous or not, you know, the young generation, it, they seem young, you know, and they get on the trains and some of the same things and I still want a seat with my disability or a friend of mine with a wheelchair. I just want to be able to share because now we're also um, changing some of the buses and cramming as many people as we can. And it's not, um, in my area, one of the buses aren't always handicapped because you have to step up to the back, mm. you know, with steps, you know, so you don't have a lot of choices. And, and, I, and I understand that you're trying to save gas, but I also get emails a lot, the green line's down, the green line's down. So I don't know if two cars are gonna help or three, I don't know how you fix that problem. But you also gotta fix the bigger picture is how people treat the trains because the smaller you go, the more, and then the ones who frequently try to jump it and um, stay on all day, you know, because they have nothing better to do. And so that seat never really gets utilized by a bunch of different people, you know, because I've seen some scary things on the train. And I, I just want to be able to sit and I mind my own business. Once in a while, I'll talk to people, but I just want to be able to get where I'm going. So if we can kind of fix that part, at the same time, you want to say gas, which I'm, that makes totally good sense. And maybe you'll have less maintenance problems. It will help, but you got like a little weird problem, you know, to figure out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Luckily, we have safety up next, and I think we'll be able to address some of those. But actually, I had this thought during the presentation. Is, is you know, the current state of, you know, the, the trains, is that coming into play in this decision as well? Or is it strictly maintenance? So, um, Chair Finley, so 
this uh, decision was made predicated purely on maintenance. However, we do have that experience from the pilot program we did as it related to the Safety and Security Action Plan in 2022. Uh, that yielded some positive results, uh, but it was, it was a pretty short evaluation period. It was about three months in, in duration. Uh, we saw some good indicators, but we would want to gain more experience. And, and part of our goal will be to track things uh, that impact the customer experience. And so uh, with two uh, vehicles instead of three, that will yield additional opportunity for our staff who are at Union Depot, Mall of America, and Target Field to be able to clean those trains more effectively between each trip. Our goal is to have each train start each trip without spills, messes, trash, refuse, those things that uh, other people who aren't as uh, quite as considerate leave behind. Uh, this will be provide us a better opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, we have some rail maintenance work coming up that's going to improve the speed on the green line. Uh, right now, we have. Uh, what are called rail brakes, uh, small uh, brakes in the rail where we have to operate at a reduced speed and that results in a time penalty. So we're operating slower. Um, you know, also, um, you know, and I could go on on this list, but I think one of the other highlights uh, could be that with the two cars, uh, we have less opportunities for people to be holding doors. And uh, that is one of the primary sources of our delay. Uh, as people may have experienced or witnessed, uh, if they've been out riding or on a platform themselves, is um, people will hold the doors for a, a variety of reasons that um, I still don't yet appreciate myself. <laughs> um, I don't know that it's well-intentioned, but uh, fewer doors is fewer opportunities to hold those doors and damage equipment. So uh, we're hopeful that we can see a little bit of an improvement and keep the trains moving uh, and maintain a better schedule. Good. Yes. Diane. Um, the plan sounds common sense to me. Uh, I do have one concern, and that has to do with how nimble are you in terms of being able to truly ramp up for some of the special days. I'm thinking of a couple of times when I've been traveling with folks who live at um, Fairview and University who are not able to stand, mm -hmm. and we've had to board and go the opposite direction one time from there all the, all the way to uh, um, Target Field in order to board a train where then they could actually sit coming back. So, um, you know, some of the things, and it, one in particular was the Women's March, what, seven years ago. Um, another was just one of the um, actual, it was during the, the Lynx championship run, um, that sort of thing where we've had to go, you know, the, the wrong way and then, you know, turn around. And so I know sometimes it's probably hard to gauge some of those things, but sometimes it's been a little difficult for folks with mobility issues. Yeah. Uh, Chair Finley and committee member, thank you for that. And I think uh, a couple of things that I'll say uh, is that, you know, we, we may not be perfect 100% uh, of the time, but I think that we've uh, built in more of a kind of a belt and suspenders approach, if you will, to evaluating uh, what are those upcoming events. And so uh, each week, myself and our operations team have weekly check-ins on Wednesdays as kind of our look ahead. Uh, and then a, another subgroup is looking ahead on Thursday and Friday to make sure that we have the right staffing identified for all those known events. Uh, we have regular touch bases with uh, the folks at at Minneapolis to be able to forecast and look at uh, what are some of the uh, the larger conventions and, and events and concerts and and those types of things. So we're able to to do our best to try to maintain a, a high situational awareness for what are all of those circumstances. Uh, and we're uh, a lot better positioned right now to be able to have the the staff as well as the equipment available so that if we need to, to deploy supplemental uh, service so we run even more frequently than advertised, uh, we've, we're in a much better position than we've been any of the last four years. So, Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll go to Andy and then I'll come to Heidi. Andy. Thanks. I just have a, a few questions here. Um, for the uh, events, is there like a set time before an event starts that it would shift to a three-car train? And if so, what, what is that? How much before? Right. Um, Chair Finley and, and Andy, uh, so the, the standard way that we've been doing it is that we will set that up for the entire service day. And so if we know that we have, uh, you know, this weekend we have the twins on 
Um, at one o'clock is their first pitch, and then there's a concert at US Bank Stadium that starts at five o'clock. We would run the service with three car trains all day. Uh, whenever we are doing the connections uh, while operating service, it, it introduces another variable uh, for making those connections that uh, our staff is really good at it, but uh, they don't always control things like the weather and, and those types of things. And so we want to take care of all of that the night before. So when we deploy service for the day, uh, we have what we need for the, the entire day. Thank you. And um, your signage and other notifying features for the two train uh, loading zone, uh, is that being developed with thought in mind to folks with visual uh, disabilities? Yeah, like Ken. Um, yeah, so uh, Chair and, and Andy, it is, and, and I'm hoping that either today or as we go, uh, when we start to um, make those attempts, uh, really what we're looking to do is, again, the advanced communication and then on the platform to have something that, um, you know, is both, uh, you know, audio, uh, visual, uh, as well as some physical demarcation. And so uh, that's still in development. It's kind of a goal of ours. I, I don't believe that we'll have it ready for April 13th, but uh, we'll be really intentional about the messaging that we do have in place to communicate that. Thank you. And then the last one is not directly related to uh, your presentation, but you did bring it up uh, as an aside. Uh, we've been hearing more, I don't know if it's the warmer weather or what, but we've been hearing more from Metro Mobility riders who are saying, you know, I don't like to take Metro Mobility at bar close, but, but I have to because the train isn't running and I can't walk to a bus stop. Um, is that part of network now to evaluate how late the train runs or is that something separate? Yeah, uh, Chair and Andy, it is, yes. So that is uh, that late service frequency has been something, as a matter of fact, at a meeting this morning, we were talking a little bit about, uh, it's a, one of the identified areas in our uh, safety and security action plan and it's really being uh, looked at for all of the pluses and minuses and looking at what is the right service delivery type to try to provide that additional access. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Heidi. Do we, um, to answer the question earlier, do we need Ken to help? Um, because he would have to stand in a totally different spot now if he was doing the two tar train, you know, the retrain himself to understand the new system. Because I don't know exactly where it's going to stop. It's got a couple of different spots it can stop. It just, it just, I just don't know. And so people like Ken would be a good, you know, person to, we could reach out and do some work on that. So then people like me can follow Ken, you know, have processing problems and figure it out. Because if Ken can do it, then, then I know I can probably follow him and figure it out too, you know, and make sure I do what I'm supposed to. Because I'm so used to the three car. And I know what it's like, because I went to the Billy Joe and Stevie Nicks concert, and you literally, if you're in a wheelchair, need to be on that train before it gets like a sardine a pack. It kind of reminds me of certain countries where you have to respect when you're on the train not to touch people, not to do things. You know, there was a whole YouTube on it, and it was really interesting how you can make the other person not happy. So when we go smaller, I want to make sure that we're not ending up with a bunch of cops coming because we can't get along with each other. <clears throat> that concert, we were like sardines, and then halfway down, everyone got off and got to their cars, and then I got out of seat, you know, because I was going all the way to St. Paul, you know, to catch the very last bus to go back to West St. Paul. So it's something you want to think about when you do certain events or think about certain days or times and stuff where we need to get along with each other, not kill each other on the train. And that concert really taught me. And I just happened to be with tons of people who were all nice and kind and having a great time. But I could be in a crowd that may not like having me there because I'm disabled and I have my crutch and whatever. And I just want to be able to enjoy my activity of the day. Just something to think about when you get smaller and bigger and how right. you plan it out. And then we should keep Ken in mind so he can help us as we can help him. Thank you, Heidi. That's that's a really good suggestion. Our one of our members, Ken Rogers, I'm sure who everybody in the room knows very well, 
um, has expressed the desire to have an auditory announcement when it's not three cars. I know that he tends to line up. This is what he's told me. He tends to line up at the first car no matter what because there's guaranteed to be the first car. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But if there's capacity issues, obviously you need to know that you're not going to be walking onto tracks and looking for a third car. <laughs> Right. And, and Chair, and, and I thank you for that, and I think that uh, feedback from, from Ken uh, would definitely be welcomed. Um, I know that he's able to, to describe that and, and what we can consider in addition to those auditory announcements. Uh, and I will say that part of our communications will uh, also include that the train will always pull to the end of the platform, uh, and so uh, going to that uh, leading end, which is where we intend to have that signage, mm. uh, is is will be the practice. Uh, it's where we have uh, things on the railroad that require signal indication and uh, we need to detect that train and so it'll always pull to that far end uh, when it's in regular service. Thank you. Yeah, I know this came up, I think, when we were doing the Southwest light rail um, um, workshops about you know, less than three cars. Go ahead, Heidi. The other yeah. thing I want to say, Ken has a dog too, so you have to think about his guide dog you know, besides him. So he has to have a spot too in order to make it work. Just like I have to have a spot for my crutch or my friend with the wheelchair. We have to make it all work with our mobility devices or whatever we use to get where we need to go. Thank you. So you have to think about that, including like a backpack or two. So it's not just downsizing, but thinking about like, if you're getting a car, you think about how your car's gotta be laid out. You gotta think about taking the train and kind of laying out, not like I'm going to live there and make it a day, but it's just I bring a backpack, you know, and Kim brings this stuff and he has a dog. So we have to think about all the different things that come with us. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi, for reminding us. Any other members have questions? Any last final comments from d deputy? No, <laughs> uh, no I'll just uh, say thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to the committee members for uh, the thoughtful feedback and advice, and uh, it's always a, a pleasure to be able to keep you updated, and I think whether it's uh, through Doug or, or others, uh, happy to be able to come back and share more news about uh, what we're up to in operations. So thank you again. Thank you. Did I see Hannah come in? Ah, yes. I thought I saw you back there somewhere. <laughs> thank you, Hannah Palmeyer, for joining us this month. Thanks for having me, Chair. Oh, yes, yes, an illustrious le legislative update. I've used that word twice in the last hour. I can't believe that. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm going to be quiet. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, my name is Hannah Palmeyer. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the government affairs liaison here at the Met Council. Um, I think the last time I was in front of you was in February before the legislative session started. So um, we are... I would say roughly halfway through the legislative session for um, 2024. The legislative session started on February uh, in February, and then um, it will end on March, or excuse me, on May 20th. Um, so the way that the legislative session is structured is there are various kind of checkpoints and deadlines throughout the legislative session by which certain types of bills need to be making their way through the various committees. So um, since I was here, the legislative session has started and uh, the legislative session has also hit their first and second deadlines, which was kind of interesting that they combined them this year. And the date for the first and second deadlines was March 22nd. Um, usually how the legislative session is structured is there's a first deadline, which is by which um, policy bills need to make their way through their policy committees in one body. And then there's usually another week or two in which the other body can kind of catch up to that with those same bills. What they did this year is there is a kind of compressed um, legislative session given that <coughs> session started in February. And so they decided to have the first and second deadline the same, which meant that all the policy um, bills needed to make their way through all of the policy committees in both bodies by the same day. And that day was March 22nd. So um, things of relevance to this committee, the House and the Senate have both um, put together small transportation policy omnibus bills um, by that deadline. So the Senate bill um, didn't have any policy provisions specific to the Met Council, but we are obviously, of course, still tracking it. 
And then the House bill did have a specific policy provision to the Met Council, which would require the State Agriculture Society, which is the entity that uh, manages the state fair, to develop a multimodal state fair transportation plan for this upcoming 2024 state fair. Hmm. So we are uh, tracking that House um, bill, the House kind of mini policy omnibus bill, and that is actually scheduled for a vote on the House floor tomorrow afternoon. Um, it's possible that when um, both the House takes up their version and the Senate takes up their version, that there could be amendments to either bill um, that could have some implications for the Met Council. So we'll touch base with you about those uh, in the, our next conversation in May. Um, and then we'll also kind of just, you know, keeping track of, of what's going on, but trying to make sure that we're engaging on a variety of topics related to transportation and transit. So um, those are kind of where we're at with the policy bills. For bills that have a financial implication, there's a different deadline. And that deadline is called the third deadline, and it is on April 19th, so about two and a half weeks from now. And that is the date by which these omnibus spending bills need to be um, considered in their various committees. And so um, we don't know yet what is going to be in the House or the Senate version of those omnibus bills, but we are, you know, attending hearings, trying to help uh, figure out what's going to be in those bills. And I, again, I think I'll have more information for you at the May um, meeting when those bills will be in a, probably not their final format, but, but we'll at least kind of know what's in both of those bills. But again, neither of those bills have been written or put together at this point. Um, also related to the supplemental budget, so on Friday, March 22nd, Governor Waltz, uh, the Speaker of the House, Melissa Hortman, and then the Senate Majority Leader, Aaron Murphy, announced that they have an agreement on joint supplemental budget targets for general fund spending for this legislative session. So in Minnesota, we have a two-year legislative cycle. We are in the second year of that cycle. The first year of the cycle is when the state uh, budget is set for the, for the state. So that budget was set last year. So anything this year is seen as supplemental, additional, um, kind of big things that maybe needed a little bit extra money so that they can be worked on. Um, so in uh, the joint supplemental budget targets for, and it's just for general fund, um, for this legislative session are going to be 477 million in new spending for this state, this upcoming state fiscal year and then $62 million in spending for the next state biennium. So sometimes people refer to the tails of bills, which is kind of future commitments that the legislature is making in their bill spending. So it's, it's just shy of 500 million for, for, this, but for this fiscal year, for this biennium, and then again about 62, 63 million for the upcoming biennium. Um, for transportation specifically, the budget target is going to be $2 million in general fund spending for this fiscal year, and then no additional spending um, outside of the already committed funds for the next fiscal year. There are no supplemental budget proposals that are specifically directed to the Met Council from the um, governor's budget. Um, but again, we'll, we are monitoring all, all of the committees and the bills that are introduced to see if it's still possible that something might have some budgetary implications for the Met Council. And again, we would know that more by the third deadline, um, which is uh, towards later on in April. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to give you an update about is related to bonding or capital investment. Um, cap this often is seen, the kind of second year of a biennium is often seen as a bonding year or as a capital investment year, although the legislature did pass a significant capital investment bill last year. Um, they are considering a, an additional capital investment bill this year as well. Um, and for that related to transportation, Governor Waltz has recommended $37 million for busway <laughs> capital improvement for our arterial bus rapid transit program. Um, the $37 million would likely go to advance the H line, which would be in the Como, Maryland um, corridor from downtown Minneapolis to Sunray mm -hmm. Transit Center in um, the east side of St. Paul. 
And then if there were any remaining funds from that 37 million, they could go to advance additional bus rapid transit lines that would be identified likely next year. So we don't know yet what will be in a capital investment bill, but that is the governor's recommendation with regards to Metropolitan Council transportation. Um, budget, or excuse me, bonding bills um, are unique because they do require um, more votes to pass. You can't just pass it with a simple majority. And so it does require um, a lot of collaboration um, between both parties and both bodies. And so oftentimes it's one of the last bills that gets passed if it is a bill that gets passed. So we likely won't have um, a lot to report on that until June. So with that, Chair, I think that is my update for this month, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, I have uh, at least one question to begin with. So I'm understanding correctly, short of the $37 million that might or might not make it um, at the very end, there's only one bill that has made it into an omnibus that involves the Met Council? Um, so, Chair, that would be specifically for transportation purposes. Okay. Um, that, that they're, and it's also possible that bills can travel by themselves. Um, and then the policy bills often are a little bit smaller than the um, spending bills, and the spending bills are going to be put together in the next few weeks. But as of right now, in the Senate and House um, policy omnibus bills, there is just one proposal related to Met Council transportation D directly. There are some indirect ones, obviously, that we're tracking, but there's just one that's related to Met Council service directly. Well, I hope you're getting more sleep at night then during session. That sounds kind of nice for you. Uh, more this year than last year, Chair. <laughs> Daryl, go ahead. Um, is, that the, that's the, is that the bill relating to the state fair? Yes, uh, Chair and Vice Chair, that is a bill related to the do state you have, fair. Do you have the bill number on that? I would have to grab that for you. I, I, I will send that to you. Thank you. Yep. But, but House Omnibus, right? You said the House Transportation It, it is. Omnibus. It's in the House Transportation Omnibus. I want to say it's House File 3436 or House File 3634. So, but which one of those? I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Oh, we'll check it out. Well, at least you remember the numbers. That's pretty good. <laughs> but I might have transposed them. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Jeff, go ahead, Jeffrey. The, the, you said Como, Maryland on the $37 million bill. What does that entail exactly? Um, Chair and uh, committee member, thank you for the question. That might be a, a better question for some of the folks behind me, but, um, but we are in the process of developing the H line, which is going to be a new arterial bus rapid transit line um, that will operate from downtown Minneapolis up through Como Avenue, Maryland Avenue, um, and then down into Sunray in the east side of St. Paul. Um, and similar to other bus rapid transit lines that we are um, either currently operating or that are in development, um, we are requesting state bonding dollars to help us with the construction of that line. There's support for it? Um, we have received state funding um, for, I believe, all of the previous um, lines that are currently being worked on and, and have been worked on previously. but. I, I would defer to, to Metro Transit to, to verify that. But yes, we um, in, in last year's bill, um, they did support arterial bus rapid transit for a, right. a, additional lines in the last year's uh, bonding bill. Thank you. Heidi, go ahead. Um, my question is, is it the money for the state fair is that for the different locations or is that the actual state fair where they try to figure out how many buses can come and how Metro Mobility can work with the buses and stuff. How is that money being used and allocated? Because I've been to the state fair where sometimes it just needs a little bit more cleanup, you know, so everyone can be friends with each other and Metro can do their thing and the city buses can do their thing. Um, excuse me, chair and committee member. Um, the, the bill that that this is language is currently advancing in the House Transportation Omnibus Bill actually is just a policy bill. It doesn't contain any money. Um, it contains a requirement for the State Agricultural Society um, to work with Metro, uh, the Met Council and Metro Transit on developing a multimodal transportation plan. But there, there is no funding currently in, oh. in that bill language. 
in the so house. So they're working on it. So if there is going to be money, then they have a plan to give them, right? Um, Chair and committee members, so if there were to be money, it would need to be in a separate bill um, mm -hmm. because this bill is specifically policy. It's bills that don't have any impact on the state general fund budget. So it's possible uh, that there might be additional um, requirements, but if that were the case, it would need to be in an omnibus spending or an omnibus budget bill. Good to know. Yeah. Any other questions from members? Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, yeah. We are cruising right along. Probably good to give a little extra time for our safety update. We have Ms. Oh, Kandaras. Hold on one second, Heidi. Hold on one second, please. Um, we have Ms. Kandaras and uh, Chief Ernest Morales the third. Please. It's nice to see both of you again. <laughs> Thank you. Chair Benley, TAC members, good to see you all. Thank you for having us today and for making time in your agenda for a Metro Transit safety and security update. Uh, as Jason pulls the slides up and you can go to the next slide. Uh, what we plan to do is provide a brief update on where we are in implementing Metro Transit Safety and Security Action Plan, and the chief will do a deeper dive into uh, the police department's work. And really, we hope to have a ample time for questions, conversation, any feedback you have uh, and would like us to consider as we continue to implement this uh, work. So next slide, please. And one more slide. So we're going to start by talking about the Safety and Security Action Plan. And the Safety and Security Action Plan is a document that we developed and the council endorsed back in June of 2022. It currently uh, contains 43 action items that we are advancing to improve public safety on transit. And part of what this slide is meant to show is that current document with the 43 action items actually grew out of a multi-year process and the Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee was involved at a few different points in this process. So it started uh, back in June of 2020, sh shortly after the murder of George Floyd, the chair of the Metropolitan Council called on the council to do a police review of the Metro Transit Police Department. So that started this first phase, the transit safety conversation phase, mm -hmm. where the council contracted with organizations to lead deep community engagement to understand from riders and other stakeholders what uh, safety on public transit meant to them. And part of what was learned through this process was that safety is much broader than policing alone, that Metro Transit needs to have a multifaceted approach to improving safety and the perception of safety on transit. And that includes having more presence on the system, which we'll talk more about in a moment, but it also includes making sure our facilities are well-maintained, well-lighted. Uh, it includes making sure we're providing reliable service because people who are waiting longer uh, for a trip or aren't sure when their bus is going to arrive tend to feel less safe in that environment. So we learned a lot from that first phase. Uh, and then the second piece of this work was the Metropolitan Council formed a police work group comprised of council members where they took in that community engagement. They developed additional, uh, or they brought in additional information um, through hearing from more people looking at peer agencies and they devised really kind of a high level framework vision for public safety on transit that then led to the third phase which was developing the safety and security action plan. And both during that police work group phase as well as the development of the action plan, uh, people came to this committee to get input that is now a part of that plan that we're here to talk a little bit more about today. So again, the current safety and security action plan has over 40 items. It's uh, separated into three areas of work. The first area is improving conditions on the system, which includes getting more presence on the system, ensuring our facilities are clean and uh, in a state of good repair uh, and other types of factors that lead to that uh, direct experience people have while they're riding. The second area of work is more internally focused. It's about training and supporting our employees. Uh, as part of the development of the Safety and Security Action Plan, we did extensive in-reach within Metro Transit to talk to 
operators, uh, public facilities workers, other uh, workers really on the front lines of some of the challenges we're experiencing on transit to understand where they felt we needed to be doing more. And part of what we heard is their interest in having more training, more resources uh, to help them navigate what they encounter when on our system. And then the final area of work is engaging customers and partners and recognizing that transit has a responsibility to make sure our, the experience on transit is safe and positive and welcoming for all, uh, but we also can't address all the issues that are visible on transit alone. Um, people in our police department, including our chief, will often say, Transit is a small window into larger societal challenges. And uh, that means to us that we need to be seeking out partnerships and building coalitions to get more uh, to the underlying causes of, of some of what we're seeing on our system. So next slide, please. So uh, while there are 43 action items in the plan, uh, several of them touch on one key component, which is developing these layers of official presence. So again, back to the community engagement we did early on in this process, we heard from our own employees, from riders, that when they see somebody with Metro Transit, uh, and it doesn't have to be a police officer, uh, just having somebody with some official responsibility leads them to feel more comfortable when riding. And so over the last year, uh, we've developed these additional layers of presence our Metro Transit Police Department still remains the foundation of providing public safety on transit. And again, the chief will speak a little bit more in depth about MTPD in a few moments. Uh, but over the last year, we've added um, additional personnel out there. So also in the police department, we have community service officers or CSOs. Uh, the police department has long had CSOs, uh, but what changed in recent months is they now have uh, responsibilities to inspect fares and write administrative citations for people who have not paid their fare but are riding. So they're out and even more visible than they were before as they interact with people uh, checking fares. Uh, we have the Transit Rider Investment Program, or TRIP agents. Uh, the first cohort of TRIP agents started at the end of February. Uh, this is uh, a result of legislation, last legislative session, as part of the transportation omnibus that was signed into law. Uh, and the Transit Rider Investment Program both uh, provided us with administrative citation authority. Prior to that change, it was against the law to ride without paying. You would uh, be guilty of a misdemeanor and receive a citation that would go into the court system. Uh, last year, the legislature changed that and allowed the council to create an administrative citation. One benefit of that is now we can have these trip agents and other non-sworn personnel inspecting fares. Uh, it doesn't only need to fall on the shoulders of our police department as it did previously when it was a criminal act. Uh, another layer of presence is our supplemental security officers. Uh, so just over a year ago, the council approved a contract with Allied Universal Security, and we now have supplemental security presence at seven different locations. Uh, those tend to be our highest boarding locations, but also ones where we had uh, high calls for police service, complaints from employees, complaints from customers. Uh, and then the final layer of presence on this slide is our transit service intervention project. Uh, this was another piece of the transportation omnibus uh, in last year, coming out of last year's legislative session. And the Transit Service Intervention Project calls on the council to establish this effort to increase both law enforcement and code of conduct enforcement, as well as social service outreach, specifically to light rail. Uh, and as part of that, uh, we've contracted with 10 different community-based organizations to help provide that service, uh, social service connection and outreach. So that project's underway as well. So next slide, please. So while presence is a primary focus right now and where we've uh, had a lot of new developments in recent months, uh, there are other elements to the Trans Safety and Security Action Plan as well. I wanted to talk a moment about this Take Pride in Your Ride campaign because it was actually feedback from the uh, Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee, I think still at the stage when the council member work group was meeting, about the importance of us educating people that uh, 
Riders' activities and behavior impacts other riders and reminding people to treat shared space with respect. Uh, and so this year, uh, we're launching this Take Pride in Your Ride campaign. At the end of last year, the Metropolitan Council adopted uh, an updated code of conduct. Metro Transit has long had a code of conduct, but this is the first time that we're aware of that the council actually adopted it as our policy board. Uh, and that became an opportunity then for us to refresh our signs, really take a look at how we're communicating those rules for riding, and look for additional opportunities to, again, make sure people, when they're riding on our system, know what's expected of them and are cognizant of the fact that their behavior affects others while riding. Uh, next slide, please. I think this is my final slide before I hand it over to the chief. Um, but another element of this is, um, you know, as a writer, we encourage you to report issues you are seeing. We have staff out there, obviously, as we build our layers of presence, we have more eyes and ears on this system, but we encourage riders uh, to report problems to us as well. It becomes another way we can uh, detect patterns of where we're having issues as well as address things in a more timely manner. So we have new signage out there that says report problems and gives people some options depending on what they're encountering. We have text for safety safety, which is uh, a way to contact us uh, discreetly through texting. Uh, and that phone number is on here, 612-900-0411. Uh, if you see something that's dirty, broken, uh, you know, that's where we will direct you to our customer relations department. Their phone number is on there. There's a QR code that will take you to a form. And of course, if there's an emergency, 911 is still the right call to make there too. So. Uh, with that, I think go to the next slide, and I believe I hand it over to Chief Morales. Yes. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to present before you. I just want to state that our commitment as part of the Metro Transit Police Department is to, pers to uh, offer you personal safety, quality of life, and protection of property for everyone in the transit community. Our officers respond to and investigate all crimes that are reported on buses, light rails, commuter, train facilities um, in the eight county region. And assist. we also assist with other partner agencies as well, law enforcement partner agencies as well. Uh, currently, we have staffing issues. We're currently at 107 full-time police officers. We should be at 171. But we also have a supplement of community service officers. At the current moment, we have 14 community service officers. We should be at uh, 70. That's what we're budgeted for. Uh, next slide. When you talk about what we've done over the year 2023, we saw that quarter one to quarter two, we were down 14% in crime. When you compared quarter two to quarter three, we were down 22% in crime. However, we saw a slight increase quarter three to quarter four of 12%, and that was weather related, and we anticipated that rise. However, when you compare quarter one to quarter four, we saw a reduction of 25%. Next slide, please. Once again, when you look at this, this is our top seven crimes. So top seven crimes are tracked by the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation on a yearly basis. And these crimes are homicides, sex offenses, robbery, assault, larcenies, theft from persons, motor vehicle theft, burglary, and breaking and entering. When you look at quarter one to quarter two, we were up 8% in this category, in these categories. When you compared quarter two to quarter three, we saw a reduction of 11%. Quarter three to quarter four, we saw a reduction of 10%. When you compared quarter one to quarter four, we saw an overall reduction of 13%. Next slide, please. Annual crime totals. Now stated, I just stated that for the year 2023, we saw a crime reduction of 25%. However, when you compare 2023 to 2022, we're still up plus 32%. Uh, crimes reported in the year 2023 were 7,800. For officer-initiated crimes, we were up 45%. What does that mean? 
That means their officers were proactive. They were no longer responding to calls for services. They were given the geographical area of responsibility. They were asked to get out of their cars, get on the trains. In between these stops, they were to step off onto the platform to make eye contact with passengers so that it was a positive interaction. You would go home speaking to your friends and your family, stating that you saw more police officers throughout the system. And then they were to go back on, onto the train, return back to their cars, and resume patrol. With that, that is my last slide. We're ready for any questions. Thank you both very much. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. I have a few that I'm going to rattle off, not all of them, but I think the most important question. So for Trans's, Transit Service Intervention Project Partners, is the um, acronym is the T silent when you pronounce that acronym? Is it SIP or T-SIP? <laughs> Chair Fenley, uh, when we pronounce the acronym, we've been saying T-SIP. I personally try to say Transit Service Intervention Project, but it's, it is a mouthful. And, and when you look at their vest, it just says T-SIP on it. So T-SIP. Thank, thank you for entertaining <laughs> my bad jokes. Um, has there, I, I know it's, we're still like under a year since the law change and the CSO stuff. Has there been any noticeable change in anything? Obviously, we have that crime down um, over the last year. Uh, but like in terms of interactions, in terms of like seeing a direct correlation, I know that sometimes that's hard. But any evidence of that? Yes, Chair Finley, great question. Yes, we have seeing dividends is paying off. We know that we need human presence. When people see human presence, they feel comfortable in the system. They're encouraged to come back. We see that with the increase of ridership as well. So it's definitely uh, a plus and an added addition, a welcome added addition from the police force as well. Um, we do know that we still have areas where we have to improve and we need extra support, but we're working toward that and we are mitigating those circumstances. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll pass it to some members first, and then Daryl, go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, and then I'll come back to myself. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just wondering about um, the St. Paul side of things, because I noticed that we don't, we don't see the same interactions in St. Paul as we have maybe when we look at the system in Minneapolis or when mm -hmm. we look at the suburbs. Um, so I'm wondering, a couple of different things. Um, in St. Paul, I know that the trip agents just started. Uh, however, are they, are any of them, are they cultural tra tra trained in cultural diversity? Do, are they trained in approaching uh, folks with mul multiple disabilities, whether it be mental illness, whether it be a physical disability, whether it be both, are they, are they, do they have trained personnel that go with them relating to, I mean, I know, for instance, in our city in Maplewood, we embed social workers into our police department, into our fire department, are, are, are any of our trip agents, are they embedded, do they have additional training and mental health issues and and those kind of additional trainings that we need because it's obvious that I I will say I was planning to come here today <clears throat> and give you guys a whole mouthful of what I've experienced on the train over the last four months but I will tell you today my trip here was very pleasant I did not know how pleasant it was going to be but I noticed the third car when I looked at the third car, there was there was police personnel on that on that car. So I presume that that's why my trip was so pleasant. Um, the last couple trips that I've taken to here have been nothing but scary and nothing but um, the worst that I've ever seen in probably 20 years of me riding the system um, to the point where I was willing to give up my cash very easily uh, for some, what I thought was very fake or very small protection in order for me to, to have a safe spot 
on the train and I didn't have to expose my daughter to to any unsavory activity that might have been going on um, because, the, you know, after I shelled out about $10, um, a couple of the, what I would say, I would presume that they were participants of that activity too, but because they had watched me enter with my family, they had uh, sheltered me and my family until we until we were close to getting off, and then they they proceeded to engage with whatever they wanted to do. Um, and I found that experience to happen to me a couple times, but my wife says it happens to her quite frequently as she goes to work very early in the morning and comes home very probably in the later in the evening. Um, but I will say it this time or these last week or so, it's been a very different experience and I do appreciate that. I don't know if it's because the weather's changing and we're just all of a sudden now starting to respect each other because we're out there more often. But I mean, there's some of that. I mean, but I want to say if there's a way that do we know how much training hmm. the, these special agents are getting? Are they getting additional training? If they're not getting additional training, who's doing the training? Who, um, is it people with disabilities, people that actually ride the system? You know, and we don't just ride the system for, during high peak times. We ride the system, you know, at very late at night, very early in the morning when nobody's riding it. Chair Fenley, uh, Vice Chair Paulson, thank you for sharing your experience and for that question. And before I talk about trip training, just want to acknowledge what you're describing on our system is not acceptable. And I am sorry that that's your experience. And we are here talking about what we're working on, but we also know we have a long ways to go. And I know the chief said that too. So I just want to thank you for sharing what you're experiencing. I hope you continue to do that with us. Um, in terms of trip training, so in the law itself, it's pretty specific on topics they need to be trained and equipped to uh, address. And it includes topics such as de-escalation training. Uh, trip agents carry Narcan and are trained on that. But your question about are, is it, do, are they receiving specific training um, regarding people who are riding uh, who have disabilities, I'm not sure about that. So I need to go back and look at that, but there could be some opportunities there to uh, strengthen the training around those areas. Yeah. Especially around mental health yeah. issues. Uh, mental illness, because because those I mean that those kind of issues yeah. spike up at very Absolutely. at very different times during the day, mm -hmm. um, maybe throughout the week, throughout the month. Yeah. I mean, you know, I know we have a very different ride if you ride the system around the first of the month versus riding the system around the end of the month. You know, yeah. So so I mean, there you know, people choose. If they ride the system enough, we know when to choose to take a, take a safe ride and when, and when it might not be so safe. But I think, we should, I think we should figure out that we should have the right and we should have, you know, like you said, strengthen the code of conduct so we know what our, our responsibilities are as riders as well. Mm -hmm. But also understand that with that code of conduct also means that you're going to be responsive to the issue. I've been, I've been robbed on the train probably three times in the last six months, when, and it's been reported twice with no, with no real response or anything. We just go about our day, go on to the next stop, and I mean, hopefully, somewhere down the line it it gets improved. But I mean, it's it's pretty disheartening when I get robbed for just a few dollars versus a couple hundred dollars. 
Are you saying you'd rather get robbed for a couple hundred dollars? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, there's got to be, I mean, there's got to be something. I mean, like, I constantly asked you guys to improve the the relationship with with the transit system at the Mall of America, including the, the bathroom there that has yeah. been shut down periodically for the last four or five years with no real real interaction about that. So when, when I go out there with my family every year, they'll let me in so I can go to the bathroom. I proceed to look around, they let me out. But normally if I go out there any other time, they suggest me to go all the way upstairs, use the restroom on first floor. If I'm waiting for a bus on, at the transit system, I'm not able to go up to the first floor to use the restroom. When you have a perfectly good facility right there and the two restrooms that are, are usable by the general public are right in, they're right across from the accessible restroom that Mr. Funk had spent, you know, he made mention of it in a news, in a news article in the, in the Pioneer Press years ago. I mean, we got federal money for that, but yet it remains to be closed all the time. And then when I push back on it, you guys tell me, well, talk to the Mall of America people. I mean, so when do we decide to say enough is enough and let's just do the right thing by people and embed us in, in your decisions right from the start instead of after the fact? Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Daryl. A couple, uh, I see you, Heidi, I'll get to you in just a second, but I think you bring two, I think, very good points in terms of disability awareness and whatever sort of, you know, training that um, the CSOs or the, or the officers receive. Um, just to, and I can get specific numbers if you want, but it's no secret that the disability community and then even subsections within the disability community are the victims of crimes at higher rates. Mm -hmm. There's also the point that I think Daryl was alluding to, which, um, you know, when you have large portions of the populations that have been unsupported in mental, in mental health, that have been unsupported in chemical dependency, sometimes are on the other side of that equation too. So we got members on both sides of the equation here. Um, so I think having at least some sort of understanding, whatever it may be, with, uh, with the CSOs and the officers is, is very, very important. Um, Heidi? Well, I'm a little confused because when I heard the announcement that you were helping for safety and stuff and making people pay, um, when I recently went to the Mall of America and, you know, for my birthday on March 11th and spent the day and then left when the Mall of America closed, I took the 54 back and I don't, you know, I have nothing against young people, but it's like a group or just like, you know, courtesy right, courtesy right, courtesy right. And I know they spent the day at the mall and they had money and I asked the bus driver and he said, I'm not going to argue with them. So it's happening not just on the trains, but it's mm -hmm. happening on the city buses. And so what you re said on the news is like, we're going to crack down on this. I thought you meant you're going to crack down on both sides, not just the trains because I see it all the time and I live in West St. Paul and we're getting more of the same because certain stores have closed in St. Paul certain things have changed so they're coming out to West St. Paul to go to Walmart and Target and grocery shopping to Cubs and stuff and so I get to see it and then going into St. Paul I see it on the trains and buses and going out to different locations because I am a person who will never be able to drive, period, for the rest of my life. And I told this to a legislator, and they said that's a great way of point, putting it. The state of Minnesota takes care of me so I can have transportation. And she liked how I put it, and then we talked about that I was on this committee, and she's very happy I am, and then learned about disability issues because she's a legislator that knows very little to nothing about disability issues. So, but she knew about our transportation, so 
and we're making a difference and stuff. So I thought you were going to do it on both sides of the street, not just the train area, because I see some bad things on the buses off and on, and I also see a lot of people not paying. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't understand your press release when you were talking about, we're going to crack down on it. And I was like, well, then it's got to be the city buses too somehow. And I know you got billions of them and it's going to be kind of hard, but there's some main ones that, like the Mall of America and mm -hmm. certain places where you could really crack down and make some differences. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Is, so this actually, CSOs are only on trains, right? Is that, is that correct? Chair Friendly, uh, yes, uh, CSOs were on the trains. However, okay. on April 1st, we started de redeploying them to the uh, bus routes to our BRTs. We began the operation on BCTC, and we also had TAP assistant agents there to help citizens with reduced fare. So we are starting to deploy them. But I want to make everyone cognizant of the fact that we do have workforce issues. So when we have availability, that's when we'll deploy them. I don't want anyone to be under the force narrative that they're always going to be on the BRTs is as available. Yeah, thank you. And so on that note, I'm going to get to my other committee members, but just since you mentioned the, the workforce thing, so the funding, so on the slide said the funding's there, you have the money, it's yes. just a matter of finding qualified candidates. Correct. Okay. That's right. been the biggest challenge that we're going through, especially in the police force. Okay, thank you. I, had, I figured that was it. I'll go Richard and then Jeff, and I want to make sure to get people who haven't said anything yet before I come back to the second round. We have time, so I think we should, we'll be okay, but go ahead, Richard. Well, related to the last question, Chair Friendly was, What's the progress on increasing, or the outlook on increasing the staffing levels? And, and the other question is, I have is uh, what uh, what sorts of situations do the T T S P people <laughs> engage in, or, or interact with? So those are my two questions. So, Chair Friendly. That's going to be two parts. We're both answer I'll have. She'll answer T S P. I'll answer our recruitment efforts. So we are currently. Uh, reorganized our community service officer program and we have a community service officer pathways program and it's to give uh, individuals who aren't necessarily registered in college which is one of those requirements we're now helping them if they're out of high school apply for college and apply for the resources we offer up to eighteen thousand dollars tuition reimbursement to any qualified candidates if they aren't receiving tuition assistance we'll give them up to eighteen thousand uh, dollars tuition. We also offer new qualified licensed p candidates in the state of Minnesota $4,000 without prior law enforcement experience to come over to the police department. If they do have prior police experience and they're lateraling over from another police agency, we'll give them up to $8,000. So we do see a slight increase in our CSO program and that's where we're investing because we believe that we want a bench full of candidates that are already working for us than trying to take from other departments and within the region. We rather build in from inside our agency so they're familiar with our procedures and protocols. Great, that sounds like a great program. Do you guys have media material on that program by chance? Yes. Oh, perfect, I'll reach out to you and get some media material on that because the more people that know about it, the better. And Did you want to say something? Yeah, I'll okay. answer the transit service intervention project piece. So uh, right now we have contracts with 10 different organizations. About half of those are focused on connecting people to resources. So uh, that can be uh, resources to address substance use disorder, shelter, housing, uh, kind of within the realm of how social service was defined um, in the legislation. The other uh, about half are more focused on outreach, providing presence, violence interrupters, and so forth. So it can vary uh, by the organization that's out there. And uh, part of the value of that for us is we're learning, you know, what type of interaction uh, leads to some impact. And so uh, we, we're still a pretty new program, but um, really trying to learn from that diversity of interaction. Yeah. Jeff. Well, um, you asked the question I had about the workforce money, but 
Just a comment I want to make. Um, so I've been on this committee for a while. I've had three people contact me in the last, I'd say, seven or eight months um, in regards to thefts on the buses. One person was on a light rail and had their phone taken. Another person had their sunglasses taken. Another person I, had their purse grabbed. So I know they can call and report those things, but what's the resolution of that? I mean, you say the crime rate's down, and I'm finding people calling me and telling me they're having these incidents happen. And Daryl brought up his situation about being robbed, too. So what's the resolution in that case when people call in? Do any of those crimes get solved? or Chair? Yes. Great question. So those cases are individually looked at, they're investigated, and we try to follow up to recover a complainant's uh, property. What I would say is in any, any major city, situational awareness is important. And when I do look into these crimes and I observe these uh, acts taking place, let's start with the BRTs. I'll see a passenger sitting on the bus in their seat comfortably like they should, and that's the experience they should have. However, they put their bag next to them, they're not guarding their property, and it's a cr like any crimes that take place anywhere in the world, is a crime of opportunity. And when you don't have situational awareness, if you're looking out in the window at something, you aren't watching your property, someone will take it. So we watch when buses pull into a stop, someone will grab your property and they'll walk away with it. On the trains, the same thing. So what we've done in Metro Transit is we have a public service announcement that reminds individuals to watch Watch your surroundings, watch your property, just to keep us honest. Um, if well, I hear what you're saying. I mean, people shouldn't take their phones out on a light rail. I don't believe they should be using their phones because that's a target then that somebody's going to grab your phone. Yeah. Well, so that's an educational process. Well, it just isn't safe enough otherwise. I mean, people can't can't use the, their phones, I don't think, on a light rail or even on buses. Because what's happened is these guys are, I heard it from all three people that called me, they grab the stuff right before the stop and then jump off. Mm -hmm. Chair? Yeah. Yes, that's, that's most common. Uh, however, I would disagree with you as far as utilizing your phone. I ride the trains and the buses quite often, and I see people all on their phones. Once again, I'm always going to advise situational awareness. As that train or the bus is pulling in, then maybe you get it closer to you or you put it away so that someone isn't snatching it out your hand and running out the exit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chair Fenley and Chief, maybe talk about the real-time information center yeah. too. And, and part of why I mentioned that is in recent years, we've made a lot of investment in our capability to look at camera feeds live and have higher quality camera footage to review. And that is something I know our police department looks at. And I mentioned that because I would advise people report crimes when they happen, even if you don't personally feel hope it will be resolved, because we have some good cases where we've been able to use that footage. But it keeps no, more of chair, an expert on yes, this than me. Yes, and thank you for reminding me of that. I apologize for that. I was under the assumption it's my everyday world, and I have to describe that to you. <laughs> we do have a real-time intelligence center where we have analysts that monitor our cameras and throughout our systems. We've just recently, uh, now we have live feed on the buses as well. So it's expanded throughout the system, and what we do is when one of these complaints are made, or even before the complaints are made, we are proactively monitoring our systems, where the monitors are constantly cycling through our whole system so that we catch something. But if a complaint is uh, made to us, such as through text for safety, I'll repeat the number, 612-900-0411, we can then focus in on that camera. There's a car number highlighted in red that was recently added and the color was changed so that you can describe your placement on the system and we can zoom right into you to address the issues. When you do utilize text for safety, I would tell you to give us as much information as possible to give us the description. Descriptions are important so that we can follow up and get the individual responsible for any negative actions that we may see. 
Thank you very much. And just one quick point there. I'm going to get to the people who have not asked questions, and I'll come back. I have you down, Heidi. I have you down, Daryl. And I have Andy down as well. Um, there are very few things, if anything, that's 100% in this world. So you're never going to solve 100% of the crimes. Um, I still, I, I think that that means that obviously we should report everything, even yes. though if there's mm -hmm. a potential it won't get solved, because we do have numbers in here that tell us crimes going up, crimes going down. We need to have those numbers. So to your community members, you know, even if you're disillusioned and you think that it's not going to get solved, still we need to have accurate numbers as to is it going up or is it going down? Because of inaccurate numbers that it's going down, well then we'll react accordingly for policies and 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 staffing levels. So we, we don't want you know false representation of 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 you know what's actually happening out there. Uh, Andy, then Diane. Um. I've got just a few quick things. The first couple are about CSOs. I know when, when uh, that was being debated, one of the things um, that dissenters were bringing up was the risk of having increased conflict uh, during the, the fair collection or administrative citation process. Uh, now that we have a book of work to look back on, what's been our lived experience with that so far? Has CSOs try to either collect fares or issue citations? A chair? Yes. Remember, great question. Uh, it's been nothing but positive. Like I said, we have uh, six layers of protection. I know uh, the general manager said five, but that sixth layer is our passengers, our customers, and it's a shared responsibility. So the fact of the matter is that when passengers see the CSOs out there doing their fair enforcement, they do it in a neutral manner, they announce it publicly, and then they go throughout the vehicle looking and inspecting for a uh, paid fares, it's been nothing but um, positive experiences. Great. And then as you're looking at recruiting CSOs, are you targeting people with uh, multilingual skill sets? Chair? Yes, absolutely. We're always looking for people that um, have the capacity to speak more than one language. Even myself, I speak more than one language. And we utilize this out in the community to help people along there looking to uh, utilize our service. Um, Around the, the points that Daryl raised, a couple of things. One, on the, on the importance of disability-related training for both CSOs and officers. I know this is now several years back, but it's amazing how many people with disabilities still bring up the unfortunate occurrence on light rail with the, or on the tracks related to the person with autism uh, and the police interaction there. So it just, I mean, it really does speak to the importance of um, layering that in has a pretty key piece to, to the training for both officers and CSOs. Um, and then uh, lastly, and I get, uh, you know, officers are hard to come by all over the place. But um, if, you know, we, we just heard from, from Brian about, you know, we, we weren't having enough operators. Uh, so, you know, we had that negotiations with ATU and we, Prior to that, right, increase the, the starting salary outside of negotiations. It seems like if you're 37% down on your staff, um, that, that maybe looking at, uh, you know, what, what we're paying versus what some other um, police forces might be paying might, might make some sense there. I don't know. But I'd be curious to hear thoughts on that and also... Uh, to, to your point, too, like what the trend is uh, with that. I know that it was good to hear the long-term plan about kind of promotion from within with the CSOs, but, you know, uh, I knew we'd been hiring for a while. Uh, I didn't know we were that far down. What's the, what's the trend line for, for those vacancies? A chair. Yes, good, good, good question. It's going to be a complex answer. So I just did analysis and I realized in my 13 months being here, I've hired 18 sworn police officers. I've lost 21 sworn police officers. So I'm losing them faster than I'm replacing them. We just started a major campaign where we have an in-state commercial. We have an out-of-state commercial. We've just launched um, three social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram, is Metro Transit PD on Facebook and Instagram. Give us a follow, please. Metro Transit PD. You'll be updated on the latest efforts that we're making on a daily basis. We also have X. That's MTPDMN. X, formerly known as Twitter, at MTPDMN. 
If you want to know what the latest efforts are for the Metro Transit Police Department, please follow those social media platforms and they'll update you. And as far as what we're doing, we just settled our contract. It's going to be ratified. We are remaining competitive in the region as far as our law enforcement partners. So I'm quite comfortable with the financial um, support that they're receiving. However, in 34 years in this profession, I can tell you that no one's going to get rich doing this job. <laughs> and we're not doing it for money either. We're doing it because there's a call for service. And you have to be a special individual in the Metro Transit Police Department to deal with societal issues on a daily basis that just beat you down. So we're looking for special individuals. We want the right qualified individuals because we police with respect, empathy, professionalism, but most importantly, integrity. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. Well, well said. Uh, Diane, I'm going to get through. So the one comment and then a, uh, another question related to what Andy, I've used the text and it's marvelous. I was on a train, somebody was, um, totally out of line and harassing people. And I just sat there and texted the whole thing. They paused the train, pulled the person off, and people were like, wow, that was amazing. And I stood up and I said, it says right there. <laughs> you all, nobody knew I was doing that. And they were all like, oh, OK, I could do that next time. It's like, because everybody just kind of like hunkered down as this person screaming and such. So it works, and, and it works well. Um, to, uh, what Andy was talking about, what you were talking about, the, the challenges. Um, I know, you know, that Minnesota right now, just across the board, has a hard time recruiting people in law enforcement, have friends in other states, and they're like, yeah, good luck, um, just because of the, you know, our political climate when it comes to um, protecting officers. So that's my question to you is, with your staffing being low, especially um, the very few community service officers, what do you have in place to protect them so that they're not out there, you know, vulnerable? And, yeah. Chair. Yes. Very good. So uh, thank you for that question because uh, we're a fairly young department. We're 30 years old. And what I've been focusing on is building the culture, just uh, little things. Our roll call room was flat white paint. I took the effort of painting it in uh, the Metro Transit colors, our police colors of blue and gold, just so they have a room where they feel like there's a room that they can report to and that's where they get their directions for the day for the tour. But more importantly, what I'm going to do now is add every member's photograph of the department so they understand that that's who you're loyal to. You're loyal to your membership. That is your second family. Unfortunately, in law enforcement, we sacrifice so much of our personal time with our families and friends, and we spend a lot of time with each other. You tend to gravitate to, towards someone who understands the trauma that you go through on a daily basis, and I think that it's often forgotten that there are human beings behind this uniform that also suffer. And that's somewhere that's something that's lost so as the leader of the organization i think it's important for me to be the example i go out there i write the system not because it's my job but because i want to be that role model for them i don't expect you to do something i'm not willing to do myself so i get on the lrts i get on the brts most often under the supervision of my supervisor <laughs> but, but it's absolutely together, yes <laughs> it's absolutely welcomed and i to answer your question the bottom line is i believe it, be, it starts from the top and i am having some growing pains of how the organization was run and i'm making those structural changes so that we improve the overall health of the police department Thank you. We have Patty, and then I think that's everybody's first round, and we'll go to second round. I'd like to follow up a little bit on what Andy was saying and what we've really been talking about um, with hiring of pe He was talking about hiring of people with different languages. What about people with disabilities, both visible disabilities and invisible disabilities that can provide um, the foreign language, the, the understanding of why, so, well, one person with a disability can't speak for everybody 
any more than, but, but I don't, I, I wonder some about, some about that and, and, you know, I don't know, I guess that's where I'll leave it. <laughs> Well, Patty, Patty, and if y'all want to chime in too. Well, the reason why I did ask for the media information regarding mm -hmm. uh, your recruitment efforts is because um, I do want to share it amongst my mm -hmm. my yeah. constituents who are mainly folks with disabilities, whether it's visible, invisible, self-identified, not self-identified. There's always right. an issue of safety when it comes to self-identifying, especially when you're yeah. in such a publicly uh, um, visible role. Um, let, 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 like with officers, but there's no reason why, you know, folks with disabilities can't yeah. fill those jobs too. Obviously, if you meet the minimum quals, that's kind of the, the, the you know, with, with every job. Yeah. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Patty. And it's easy <laughs> to say that I have multiple disabilities. Some of them are visible, um, but the ones that aren't visible cause me a lot more problems. <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, I want to say at times, okay, folks, <laughs> it's not the arm, it's not the leg, it's not the wheelchair, it's the brain at this moment <laughs> malfunctioning. But it, yeah, yeah, I'll well, shut and up. And there's also the fact that, you know, PTSD and depression are technically disabilities, and when you're in a high... Uh, yeah. High stress environment, you know, you're gonna no, you're gonna I suffer from these things. <laughs> and mental illness is not the only. Um, mm -hmm. I know I have what they call functional neurological disorder, where it doesn't happen often, <laughs> but it can. Sometimes, if something triggers it, and I've never had this happen on a bus or you know, any transit, but that it can manifest itself in physical form, you know. And so we don't understand that kind of thing enough. That's not a, well, I'll shut up. You're bringing up <laughs> a larger philosophical question, which is about normalizing disability, where it's yes. not a good thing or a bad thing, it's, it's just a thing. It, yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And we're all going to have one at some point in our Somebody, lives, I guarantee exactly. you. I have disabilities. You can't see them. You know, right. I'd exactly. probably qualify. I can see them. I don't, I don't have them. <laughs> yes, yes. But that's, that's, a, that's a bigger societal question. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're always working to chip yeah. away at. Did either one of you want to respond? Or you're just going to let us go back and forth. <laughs> well, I'll just say, Chair Fenley, I, I really appreciate you raising that point. And I... I definitely want to make sure you have information about how people can work for us, and I think mm -hmm. we can always grow in how we're intentionally yeah. making sure we're hiring people with a variety of backgrounds. Because yeah. I, the other thing that went through my mind, um, you know, we've done uh, Metro Transit has done a lot on website mm -hmm. redesign and usability testing where they got the people that use, you know, mm -hmm. that have the issue, obviously have the issue at the moment, are in that process. And I would say the same thing apply. I mean, it's, it's a long, it's just using a different example yeah. for it. I support what you're doing. I'll shut up. For now. Well, Chair, I just wanted yes, to share, ahead. for anyone that is interested in joining the MTPD, you can go to metrotransit.org slash join MTPD. metrotransit.org Metro slash join MTPD. I'm always looking for a new job, Chief. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, can, I ask my, can I ask a question? Now? Yes, go ahead, go ahead, Carol. Right. So a couple, I have one good comment and one not so good comment. So the, I'm going to say the not so good comment first of all. The, the text to um, your text program, uh, anonymous text for safety, doesn't work at all. Because when, when in the last two months when I was robbed, Twice, we waited on the platform for over a half hour after um, my wife had texted um, anonymously. Uh, we waited to see what would happen, if anything would happen. Nothing happened. And I can prove to you that we waited that long because we, we recorded the incident. 
And the other and the other comment, the good comment was, I heard both of your your uh, interviews on NPR just last was it last week? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago already. Um, you did fabulous job. Um, the, even the call the call in the call in. I thought you guys staged that a little bit, so we'll have to talk about that later. But is we all we all know who the who those who those participants were, um, but I I was listening at home and I thought you guys did a fabulous job on that and and I know my wife and I are eager to sit down with both of you and and Cheers Alley to um, talk about some things privately and try to get a handle on some things that are happening on the St. Paul side particularly. Chair, yes. may I respond to that? Yes, you can. So I, once again, I do apologize for those negative experiences that you've had throughout the system. However, I would say in that instance, when you are robbed and someone forcibly takes money from you, you must call 911. You must call 911. It's a crime in progress and we have to immediately respond. Whereas text for safety is great, but it's a delayed response. We have yep. to right? We have to track that and then we have to, we prioritize our calls. So when you call 911 you say, I've just been robbed, that's going to immediately alert us so that we can immediately respond to you. Right. So that's, that's number one. Um, I, I lost my train of thought where else I, I wanted to go, but that was, that was the important message there. Thank you, Chief. Yes, thank you. All right, Heidi, you've been waiting patiently for a long time, and then I'll get to Patsy, yeah. okay. And I do know how to answer that question, because I went to the website, because I'm updating my cell phone, and you said that was the texting was non-emergency type incident, and you made it very clear to call 911 if it was an actual crime or something that really needs a cop to, or, you know, take notes and do all sorts of things. And then the other thing is, are you doing mental health, because... The pandemic is, and the news just reported about the shootings of people that end up in the hospital, and they take great pride of helping them and doing it, but they also need mental health to do this stuff. So keep that in mind so you can keep your recruiting people coming. So when they get kind of burnt out or fed up or someone just pisses them off, they get the help they truly need to order, because maybe you've got someone who really wants to do this for a living and wants to help the community, and how do you keep them engaged and happy and, you know, wanting to get up every morning? And then the other thing is, I did see this in the bus shelters, but we need to start redesigning our bus shelters because we don't make our signs really to work sometimes to stick on the thing correctly. You know, like parts of it might get blocked up. We had this problem when they redesigned where to put all the bus numbers and stuff, and it was in some some bus shelters, really dumb spots, and others, no one could read it if you're in a wheelchair. Now this is a big school rectangle thing, and you want enough of it visible so my phone can take it and I can take a snapshot and stuff. So it's the placement, so we have to be really creative. If this is a big sign, because it is, a big sticker thing, and it goes inside the thing. The report problem sign. Yeah. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, thank you. Um, we need to um, be creative in how we stick it on there, because some, yeah. some places it's like, well, it could have been better location, but you don't really have good locations for certain stickers. You figured out when the pandemic was to just cover up the whole side window and say, follow A, yeah. B, and C, maybe you could maybe utilize some of the side things and do something or be creative because um, they're putting them inside the shelters and not each shelter is meant for these giant stickers because we have all different shapes and sizes and ideas. So think about that in the future when you design your, yeah. let's help the community with, you know, and how you get it out there and stuff. And, and most of these for people who can um, see. So a blind person want to have any understanding. So you have to find another way for them to be a part of it. Or people who can't read, um, do you have anything where I can direct them to a website? Or if they do have a cell phone, 
and it can read it to them and they can process the information because people with processing might be left out of the picture. And so we got to do some heavy training because they want to be out there too. So please think about all of that. Thank you very much. Did you have a response or? Yes, Chair, please, yes. please, yes. I, I can respond to two of them. Thank you for going to the website and pointing out the differences between a non-emergency and emergency, first and foremost. But I just want to touch upon your, uh, uh, the trauma that individuals uh, first responders experience. So we do offer services through Sand Creek. So anyone who may be uh, suffering from post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, we do refer them over to qualified professional health, mental health uh, professionals. Let him finish. Can you let them finish real quickly? But yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you, Heidi, but this yeah. is a little, let the chief finish. No, I just, those were the points that I wanted okay. to make. Okay, Thank yes, you. go ahead, Heidi, I follow I was just up. thinking just regular mental health, like, yeah. I really like this job, but I'm burnt out because the community is heavily on me. At the same time, I'm doing what I was sent out to do, and I just need someone to talk to going, I'm doing a great job. What am I doing? I feel like crap, you know? And it's like, I'm not making a difference. So who do you talk to? It's kind of like the <clears> nurses <throat> were getting burnt out. I can only help so many people. And then they got burnt out and left. The, you don't want, you want to keep them engaged into if they're really like a good candidate and you can see them grow into the business, you know, and maybe get a real badge and real jobs, you know? I'm not saying this is not a job. But there's all these avenues they could, you know, grow into and really help the community. So it's just not just one type of thinking, but it's the whole body taking it in. Because that's if the pandemic didn't teach you anything. It wasn't just that. It was the whole body was experiencing all sorts of different feelings. And do we have a place to go to when those things happen? So this is something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. I think that's a really good point. You know, we all do play a role in supporting members of our community, even if we don't personally know them. So thank you for that. Patsy, and then Daryl's going to take us away. Um, well, before Patty had spoken up, I, this was on my mind, and it was exactly what Patty brought up. Um, I myself am one, most of the people here know it, but I spend a lot of time at the Capitol. I'm not only here because of the transportation, but I'm also part of the TBI Advisory Committee. I myself had a traumatic brain injury 30 years ago. Now, before that had happened, actually, um, we talk about disability. I'm epileptic, and I was at a bus bench, and a lady came out of the uh, Riverside Hospital there. I'm guessing probably came out of the psychiatric unit, but she had her own issues. And when a bus didn't come, she turned to me, pulled my hair, and she was pulling me all around. Numerous people called the police. Okay, a police officer comes. Like I said, I'm epileptic. I started to have a seizure. Oh. The officer at that point pulled me, put me into the car, handcuffed and everything, and oh. To me, that was yeah. what started me trying to be much more advocating for those with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Then in 91, when I had my head injury, which two of you looking at me can probably guess, it's very what I call silent epidemic unseen injury. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of advocating for that, just like mm -hmm. Patty was saying. You yeah. do not see, yeah. but I would really not want to see what happened to me is I started to have a seizure, and I was the one being believed to be being combative to the officer. Um, so you, when we look at people who are going to try to be in these different roles, yes, hopefully, I guess even all the way up to the top on down, mm -hmm. they understand that there are silent epidemics, unseen injuries, Mm -hmm. and how, how, like Daryl was saying, there can be things. I may be fine here right now, and I'm just going to use Heidi as an example. Because of the way that Heidi is talking or whatever, could set me off just because of my head injury, but it's nothing you would notice. And it's not that you're a weak person or, you know, it's yeah. not your fault. Correct. Yeah. So... 
I, hopefully it makes sense to you, what I'm trying to say, but there, it's not always going to be somebody who is homeless, drunk, yeah. Yeah. on drugs, you know, whatever. There's so many different things that are going to be happening. And I'm a strong one for this whole idea of silent epidemic, the unseen injury. Mm -hmm. And Claudia, yes. you can talk oh, to Claudia about it. She's done videoing with me. And uh, I did a videotaping with her, and she just called me a couple weeks ago, making sure that I was going to be coming to the next, what do you call it? It's been conversation. Yes. Yes. Um, but Claudia is very good about it. She understands exactly what's happening with me and how I am so, so gung-ho about it. And with that, thinking about it, when we talk about calling in, I was at one of those meetings a few years back, and there were some people at that table. They didn't know that I was a member, but um, they kept complaining that something happened with their driver. The metro driver was doing whatever. And I said, did you call it in? No, nah, maybe he just had a bad day. Well, after a few different people made that type of comment, I said, but you know what? What if he had a bad day, but what if that was just maybe an uh, unfortunate personality that gentleman has? Lo and behold, there was one of the Metropolitan Council people, or Metro Billy, whoever, that was at the table and just kind of nudged me and let me continue on being the moderator of it all. But I really push for people to call, even if it's one thing, because you never know. Somebody could have had a bad day, but it could also be a consistent thing that somebody does. So mm -hmm. I'm a strong believer of that. Call in every single time. Hopefully you guys don't get upset with us. No. <laughs> no. And I know listening to you, Deputy, you're not going to be upset. So They want you to call. Yes, please. <laughs> um, and thank you for bringing us full circle on the awareness issue with your personal story. It makes, it, it does help ground us when, oh, this actually happened to an individual. Daryl, if you can keep it short, you have yeah, um, one I'm minute. Gonna bring it back <laughs> okay. real quick to uh, fire evasion or um, courtesy rides. The one, the one thing I noticed last week when I was coming out of town or going from downtown to Maplewood was that the driver, had, um, he was got some thrown at him. He got, he got spit on, he got, he went over, the passenger went over to the other side of the bus, to the driver's side, and proceeded to uh, spit at him or spray something in the driver's side window. The driver then um, pulled out the mace, shot the mace at him, and luckily uh, we were able to proceed on our way. The one thing, the reason I'm bringing all that up in and that order is because I asked the driver, you know, I said, well, you know, um, you know, how often does this happen? I, you know, I feel sorry that this had happened to you. And, you know, he was all shook up. You could see he was visibly, visibly shaken. And he said, well, this was his eighth time wow. being assaulted and being abused and being, being accosted as a bus driver. So I said, why do you keep doing this job? But, but he never answered me that question throughout the 20 minute ride. And then he said, uh, he does the ride job because he, you know, just, he feels stupid enough to do the job. And I said, well, no, it takes a special person like you to do this job. And I, I appreciate you doing it. And then, and then we went on, we had a deeper conversation to, about courtesy rides and what that looks like. Um, he said throughout the course of his eight to 10 hour shift of riding the bus, 75% of his rides throughout that day are courtesy rides. And he said, absolutely, he believes the courtesy ride issue is just a, uh, a farce for fair evasion. He doesn't want, um, he, the reason he ex just says, yeah, 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 to everybody, 
It's because he just doesn't want to engage in that ninth, in that ninth assault that he, where he's going to lose his life. And I had asked him throughout the course of our ride, you know, how, you know, how often does this happen? He said multiple times a week. And then I, we had stopped on the side of the road as he was talking to another driver that was passing in a, in a bus, passing by. And, and it was right after the concert had let out, you know, the concert at the, at the, uh, X, at the XL Center. And he had told me, and the reason why we had stopped, because I, because at this point, there was about six of us still on the bus, and we were getting agitated. We wanted to get home, right? And and so at this point, I said, "Well, why just stop the bus? Why did you do that?" Because he had just that driver had just been engaged in some some unsafe activity as well. So. It was the, it's that kind of conversation that I bring to you with a heavy heart to say, yes, um, being able to give a courtesy ride is a, a blessing, but there's got to be a limit to it, too. I mean, when you talk to drivers that say, I've given that guy six courtesy rides this week, when do we say enough is a, enough is enough? Um, because we know that he's using it in a totally different way. He's not using it to evade or to go to a safe spot, anything like that. Thank you, Daryl. We are over time. You have given us a lot of your, your time here, more than, more than we requested, and I do appreciate that. So if you would like to respond, you're, you're more than welcome to, but I do want to wrap this up. Maybe just a quick reply, okay, yes. Chair. Go ahead. Paulson. Um, Thank you for sharing that. And I'll just say uh, assaults on transit workers are something that should never happen. It's something we track, keep data on, look for ways to prevent them. So um, sadly, they do happen. And, and we take it every instance seriously and are looking continuously looking for ways to avoid it. And uh, fair, fares are a point of conflict. Like as the operator you spoke to was describing, our operators are trained to be fair informers, not fair enforcers. We don't want our operators to be uh, putting themselves in that conflict. And that's why we're building up these different uh, layers of personnel. One of the reasons, not the only reason, obviously, but one element of that is so we have more personnel who are doing the fair inspection. But what you're touching on, I'll just note in closing, is as part of the safety security action plan, we do have an action item around this whole issue because it's something we hear every day from our employees, exactly what you're touching on. So I appreciate you sharing it in this form as well. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you both very much for coming. I had a feeling it was going to go over. So I'm, I'm glad that you all were able to stick around with us. Thank you both Absolutely. very much. Thank you. We do appreciate the safety updates. We really do. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who would like to make a comment? I've got a quick one. Go ahead. Member uh, of the public. I will not be around as a liaison for the next several meetings. Uh, I'm temporarily in a different position. So um, I'll be uh, uh, probably a couple, three meetings away, uh, but might be able to return after that. Um, are there any members who would like to make a comment? Yes, Carrie. Um, I didn't see on the schedule uh, on the agenda that we, or, and I got an email stating that there's there's uh, construction going on uh, going on, um, and there's like holes everywhere, and there's a big huge hole on yeah. I think it's Cedar or what what Wabasha, and I think that uh, I, I'm not sure how long the construction is supposed to be happening, but I think. Um, we need to let everybody know that um, people who use Metro sh or use the bus should uh, go and start using Metro because they should be, it's, it's gonna, it's just, just hard to get around town. Um, but I think that 
if this is going to continue, we should have a have somebody come and talk about how long this construction is going to go around here. Yeah. Until winter. Yeah. What? Until winter. I, I mean, it's a joke. <laughs> We, we really don't. There are only two seasons in Minnesota, construction season and winter. Right. <laughs> do, do any other members have comments? <coughs> I have yes, one. Heidi. Um, I felt the okay. same way because it seems like every time I come downtown to St. Paul, I'm like being rerouted or rewalked, you know, to a totally different way of doing it. So it's hard to, for certain disabilities, to learn all this right now because it's really confusing. And also, if you have certain mobility problems, it's kind of hard. Like she's saying, because I asked her earlier, how are you going to get home? And she said, I'm taking Metro now. Because I remember last month she took the three bus, and now she can't even do that correctly because it's all blocked off. So it's really changing how we think about the world. And if this is going to be like a big concert thing, and I know St. Paul, just the mayor last night on the news, just put out that he's raising taxes so the roads can get fixed. But they also got to think about how we're going to get to certain places because it's getting to the point where I don't even understand that anymore. But, so I just wanted to bring that up. So I feel for her. And if we could in the future have something where we can talk about it with, even if the mayor comes, that would be lovely. Thank you. Do any other members have comments? Uh, Go ahead. Just in response to these two, I wonder if one of the, I know I've subscribed in the past to the rider alerts that Metro Transit has, and those talk about construction that relates to routes, you know, and how routes are affected. That might be one way. I mean, it doesn't go to the level of the pothole on, you know, 7th and Wabasha or whatever, but for yeah, whatever. She makes a good point, and I, I do get those, but it's just getting okay. to the point where we just can't keep yeah. up anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. We are adjourned. Good meeting. Yeah, very good meeting. Uh, Got any spring plans?